Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so glad that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do so is to like us on Facebook. We post all sorts of information there. And don't forget that there's an audio version of this message on Apple Podcasts. Just search the Foundry Church. With that said, let's dive into our Advent series called Expecting. People walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light is dawned. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. I wonder why Mary's left town so suddenly. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Isn't Mary engaged to Joseph? Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a son. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And will call him Amen. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Since I am a virgin. Did you hear about Mary's condition? Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Mary, Mary, I believe you. The angel told me not to be afraid to take you home as my wife. What is conceived in you is from the Holy Spirit. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. For us the child is born, to us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. So today we enter into a series called Expecting, Expecting. Now I know this, a number of you had expectations going into this past weekend with Thanksgiving, right? There's tons of expectations. And um, I remember as um, as a little boy, uh, Thanksgiving was one of my favorite holidays because we would go to my grandmother's, early, grandma and granddad's early in the morning and um, it was funny because... One year, we just, all of a sudden, my granddad opened up the gun case, threw a ton of guns and ammo in the back of the, of the Ford Bronco, and he's like, guys, get in cars, we're leaving. And I was like, this is great. Like, I, this is what it's about. I don't know if we were shooting turkeys or what was going on. Um, apparently, my questioning, my brother and I questioning my grandmother continually and being pests drove her to say, do something with them. And he said, okay, and I was like, oh, were you going to put us down? But he wasn't. He just took us out onto the desert of western Colorado, and we went rabbit hunting. We got two rabbits over the course of like 10 years, but really what it turned into is we'd shoot and have some fun. We'd bring clay pigeons, and eventually it became into the hat throw. You'd bring a hat out, you'd throw your hat, and if whoever, you know, I guess disliked you the most in the family got to shoot at your hat. And we had a great time with it. It became a tradition, and every year I was like, God, please don't let anything get in the way of what I was expecting to happen. I was so excited every year as a little boy to go out on the desert because it was one of the days where my granddad wasn't a businessman. He wasn't this larger-than-life personality. He was a little kid with a 16-gauge, like, antique, awesome pump-action shotgun, and he shot my favorite hats. It was awesome. And, like, it was great because, like, you would get a shoot at it, and I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, even with scattershot, and I'd throw my hat up, and he'd just boom, and I was like, oh, no, and I was like, this is great, and it was, I loved it. I, there was so much expectation. Maybe for you, you were excited this past weekend. 
as Thanksgiving rolled around, maybe a college kid's coming home, maybe your, you know, your newly married son or daughter, or maybe just everybody's going to be around, maybe you were dreading it. Maybe you were putting on your survivor gear. You got your Bear Grylls pullover, his knife, and you're like, I'm just going to make a fire in the living room and get through it. I'm going to survive this weekend with the crazies I call beloved. Right? Maybe that was you. I just know this. Expecting is something we do. We're always expecting. And as we lean into this, we get to grab onto maybe what Mary was thinking. Maybe what Israel was expecting. And recognize that this expecting language fits well in Christmas. It fits really well in Christmas. I want to talk today, and we're really springboarding this entire series out of Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at it and understand that the prophet Isaiah, he was, uh, would have been in active prophetic ministry between 740 and 700 B.C., and we understand that he was during the time of King Ahaz, the the most evil, despotic king in Judean history. He was during the reign of King Ahaz. And Isaiah was this prophetic voice calling out in this time of desolate heartache and unfaithful Israel or Judah to the covenant. He's calling out and he's speaking in such a way, well, that it challenged the very throne of Judah. Ahaz, the king, hated Isaiah because he was calling it out. But during this dark and kind of monstrous time where even the temple was shut down and locked up, we find the phrase of Isaiah, the virgin will be with child. And we will call him Emmanuel, God with us. I mean, things that just don't even make sense in the darkness of that time. We see this happening, and there are four promises in Isaiah chapter 9 that really tell us that something special is about to happen. We should be expecting something with the Messiah. Remember, this is 700 years before the Christ child is born, and it says this, he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Four prophetic promises about the identity and the person of the Christ, of the Christ child, the anointed one of God who will save us from our sins. I invite you, if you have your Bibles, you can pull them open to Isaiah um, chapter 9. Isaiah is the first book after the wisdom book, so after you get through Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and then there's Isaiah, and we get to Isaiah 9. If you don't have your Bibles, no worries. The words will be on the screens. Um, Where you're at, you can follow along. It says this, Nevertheless, There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation, increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at harvest. Literally, we had Thanksgiving. That should have connected somewhere. Remember, like Thanksgiving, harvest, cornucopias, turkeys, pumpkins. Yeah, I mean, I just maybe I thought there'd be a connection there, but swing and a miss. I guess you have to pitch it to hit it, but um, yeah, that hurt a little. Um, they will rejoice like people at harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, that's a historical defeat, remember Gideon, the, the prophet, so Gideon against the Midians, um, You have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot is used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, uh, and they will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, There will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. 700 years before Christ is born, these words are written by the prophet Isaiah. 
and you just get that kind of, that, that haunt of the eternal saying, you know, God outside of time and space is speaking truth into it. And he's making known things that should probably make us go, whoa. Like even the oldest, like people have said that, um, well, you know, this was maybe rewritten or tweaked. You know, the, the manuscripts after the birth of Christ. One of the scrolls, one of the oldest scrolls of Isaiah found, intact scrolls, is from 100 years before the birth of Christ. With Isaiah 53, Isaiah 9, all these messianic promises. So it's right there. The truth of it is right there. And here's what we know. Isaiah gives names to God, right? He gives names to God, and we, we kind of identify people with those names, right? We, we identify people with names. We can, you can give somebody, like as a Denver Bronco fan, um, I was asking my brother, I said, how are the Broncos? And he's like, oh, the donkeys are killing us this year, right? When you call them the donkeys, we know it's not a good year. When the Lions fans usually call them the lowlies. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah, the lowlies. Oh, the lowlies are killing us. We have names that, well, it speaks something. He gives us names that speak something. Wonderful counselor. What does that mean? What does that term mean to be a wonderful counselor? To be one who speaks counsel that is wonderful and beyond what would be normally just easily understood. It comes into our lives like good news, a wonderful counselor, a counselor who speaks truth, The worst kind of counselor is like, it's okay, that's who you are. Keep doing it. Make society bend to you. That's not usually a good counselor. A counselor who is wonderful will say to you a hard truth that calls you into new living. And God gave us a wonderful counselor, an advocate, if you will, in legal terms, one to stand up on our behalf and win the argument against our mortal soul. Win the argument that the accuser Satan would have against us. He is a wonderful counselor who speaks on our behalf and also speaks and leads and guides us in ways that lead us in paths of righteousness. I love the idea that one of the names of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, is wonderful counselor. Now, how would that look? In the biblical narrative, how would it look? How maybe maybe the question is like, that's a great name, but give me some proof, right? Give me some proof that he actually is. So I want to kind of paint a, a backdrop, if you will, of a story. There's this guy named Zachariah. He's married to a lady named Elizabeth, and they've been unable to have children. They are old in age. The angel Gabriel came to Zechariah while he was doing priestly duties, and he said, your wife Elizabeth, who is well advanced in age, she's about to have a, a child, and here's what he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be raised like a Nazarene. There's a whole bunch of theology around that. Can't go into it right now, but here's the thing. No razor is to touch his head. He's never to drink any wine or fermented drink and basically lay out this thing that um, John is going to be this prophetic just powerfully influential teacher, this leader, right? So Elizabeth, who's very old, gets pregnant, and she, she's going to have a baby. Jump six months ahead. Same angel Gabriel shows up on the doorstep of a young lady named Mary, and he says, Mary, blessed are you among women, for you have been chosen to carry the Christ child. And he unfolds the mystery of God to this young girl who was not expecting much more than just basically being a carpenter's wife in a Judean village, paying her Roman taxes, staying out of trouble, and hopefully having enough to eat every night when they go to bed. They were going to get by. And they were going to have a good little life up there in Nazareth. The angel shows up and says, you're going to have a baby. Indeed, she was going to have a baby. The Holy Spirit would come upon her in power and impregnate her. And her husband, Joseph, being a man of noble character, didn't want to divorce her and do her wrong and kind of publicly shame her, so he's going to do it quietly. But the angel shows up in a dream of Joseph's and says, Joseph, Mary's not lying. Because what would you do, fellas, right? If, if your fiance is like, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, it's God's. What would you do? You, you would have some questions, and justifiably so. 
But the angel appears to Joseph and says, marry her. You can trust her. So he does. Mary, this is about six months after Elizabeth, who is Mary's aunt. Elizabeth is pregnant. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, okay? She goes to visit Elizabeth. This secret is not known to Elizabeth yet. But she's going to visit her aunt Elizabeth. Check this out. In Luke chapter 1, verse 39 to 45. At the time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. Now, just sorry, quick segue. Judea, 70 miles south of Nazareth. So, I mean, hurried down, hurried, you know, via donkey or hoof. You know, she walked down, she hurries down any number of months pregnant to Judea to see her aunt Elizabeth. That She goes to see this aunt in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now get this. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her started jumping like she had eaten spicy Thai, right? The baby leaps inside of her and begins jumping around in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit coming upon her, but filled with the Holy Spirit in a loud voice, shouts something out. So I want you to just imagine, like we, we all either had family over or we went to somebody's house. And usually when you come in, there's a few people like, hey, 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 you're watching the Lions, they're losing. And you know, just the different kind of commentaries going on. But can you imagine if someone stood up and in a loud voice turned and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear, to which Mary was probably like, ah! Silent. How do you know? See, we, we forget we have historical lenses on that remind us that, you know, Elizabeth would find out and everything's okay. But Mary hadn't told her. She stands up and screams when she comes in, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. You will bear. Mary's got to be like, so is this just Judean news? How's this getting out? How do you know this? Elizabeth goes on, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? To which Mary had to be like, huh, okay, we'll just keep listening. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is he, is she, who has believed that the Lord would fulfill the promises he gave her. Like, I mean, you talk about getting your mail read. Mary had to be like, this is amazing. How did this play out in Mary's life? Can you imagine as Mary walks the 70-some miles down to where Elizabeth lives, trying to explain to her, I'm pregnant. I know Zachariah's a high priest, so, so maybe you'll understand. But I'm pregnant. The Lord said it's his, and he told it to Joseph. We're, keep, we're gonna get married, and um, I believe it's the Messiah, and you probably have all these stories built up in your head. And all of a sudden, a wonderful counselor reveals something to Elizabeth and says, she, the Spirit of God filled her. And like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen a kid who's drinking out of a hose, and then their older brother, the older brother, turns it on, they're like, and it just like comes out of every pore on them. Have you ever seen that? It's a magical thing to see because all of a sudden you see like two water jets come out their nose and they're like, and it just, that's what Elizabeth had. She couldn't keep it in. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and began wonderfully counseling Mary on what she was carrying. She was telling her, don't you be nervous about who you have inside of you. How could I be so blessed to have you in my house? My goodness, the Lord has come and blessed me by your presence. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Mary had to kind of be like, that's right. I knew I heard correctly. I didn't get some bad lamb one night and have a vision. This is true. That's right. Can you imagine the joy? Like what wonderful counsel is that? When Elizabeth, full of the Holy Spirit, shouts this out. Elizabeth is the one who's supposed to have good news. She's like 80 having a kid, which... 
Okay, that can be good news, but that seems like it'd be like super late in life to have a kid. But she's the one who's got big news. And she voids all that news to celebrate and be the living mouthpiece of the wonderful counselor. We get a a bit of a preemptive look into what the Christian life's going to be. The Christian speaking prophetically, maybe mysteries they don't even understand by the power of the Holy Spirit filling them and saying something that sinks deep into the heart of someone who needed to hear a word from the wonderful counselor. Mary came to Elizabeth with a great overwhelming secret, but it was no secret to God. And Elizabeth's words by the Holy Spirit must have landed. Oh, man like water on a dry throat. It must have felt really good to hear those words dance on her drums, right? And just be like, yes, yes. She probably played them over and over and over. Mary knew the prophecies. I love in that that bumper video we do where she's just laying there and you can hear the voice of the prophet and the virgin will be with child. And she's like, oh, that's me, you know, like hard to believe. But then to hear it out of the mouth of her aunt. So tonight I want to talk real quick about relying on the wonderful counselor. It is the gift to the Christian to be spirit-filled. It is a gift for you to have. It is a gift for you to open, receive, and make use of. It is yours to, well, rely on, to have the wonderful counselor. You may think, okay, Eric, whatever, how can that help me in this season? Like I said, this past weekend, we had visitors come by, didn't we? It's been a busy weekend with Thanksgiving. Nobody's really reacting, but I'm guessing some of you had Thanksgiving. I know I did. Hence the shape, but it was delicious. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the day, sandwich the day after. Anybody go sandwich, or do you make a traditional plate? Who goes sandwich? Who makes a who reheats a plate? Oh, boo, boo! Ah, oh, oh! We're so not close anymore. All right, I'm a sandwich guy. I'm like, you got to make sandwich extra mayo. But anyways, again, body by mail. All right. So here we are. How can this wonderful counselor impact our season, the season we're living in? How can we rely on that? Well, you're going to encounter visitors, aren't you? Doesn't it seem like at Christmas time people decide to pop by a lot more often? Or you have gatherings at your house. Someone shows up in dinner time-ish and you're like, we could make it stretch, right? And you think that they're just like, you know, maybe they were just lonely or they just wanted to talk or they had to drop your kid off from soccer or something you're doing and you find yourself like saying, do you guys want to just stay for dinner? And you have a conversation. Visitors are coming, whether planned or unplanned. They're coming into your life in this season. Are you living in the counsel of the Holy Spirit to speak words into their life that are transformational to their spiritual being? transformational to their very life that they're living? Are you willing to live under the influence of the Spirit so that you can say something that makes maybe no sense to you, but you are compelled by the Spirit to say it, knowing that maybe for in God's purposes this will land in a pretty deep place in their life? Again, think with me just for a moment. Elizabeth was pregnant, had been barren all her life. And she was pregnant. That should have been the news. But when the Spirit of God filled her, she had to tell a young, single girl that her pregnancy is the very gift of God in her life that she didn't know was pregnant. You may think, God, I can't just say this to them. I think Elizabeth might have, might have had that reaction if God hadn't fire hosed her right? And I do think he, like, drinking out of a fire hose. I think God rushed into her life, and she couldn't hold it back. I pray that God rushes into your life so that you rely on the counsel of God's Spirit, that you rely on the wonderful counselor. And here's how I see it. Relying on God for counsel means that you're seeking for him, seeking earnestly and willing to do more than the basics, to do more than a basic, but searching like you would for the French fried onions for your green bean casserole. Have you ever been sent to the store because you thought you had French onions, but one of the kids weirdly decided to eat them 
And you're like, so that was the smell last Tuesday, Josh, right? And well, he didn't. I'm sorry, son. Um, but, <laughs> but, but you know, like, like you're like, where's the French fried onions? I ate them. Oh my word! Now we need them. It's the night before Thanksgiving. We're making green bean casserole. You go to Meyer, and it's been picked over like a carcass on the savanna. It's just like no, there's nothing there. You know, there's like onion hoops by some weird brand. You're like, nope, that's the devil. And you go off, and you're like, I'm gonna go find French's French fried onions. And you go there, and you go to Family Fair. Next thing you know, you're calling from like a Walgreens in Coopersville, and you're like, I think I found them. The guy's looking in back, and you hear the guy say, sir, you can't be back here. Are there onions? Do you have onions? I need the onions for the green bean casserole. They have them. You're like, Maranatha, they have them. Yes, the pilgrims will live. I'll be home in an hour. Boom, right? You've done it. You've gone beyond the basics, and you've really sought and worked hard to get that one thing, that one thing. What if, what if we believed that if we didn't have this one thing, this reliance on the wonderful counselor, that something just wouldn't be right? That we would sound like religious clanging gongs who only tell people how sinful and messed up they are. We don't love e- any each other. We just do the basics. But what if we seek him like we're desperate? We do all the preparations, don't we, for the perfect Christmas. Perfect Christmas card. Anybody have that one? You're like, everybody's, and you know it's a moment in time when you capture it because like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we got it. Oh, yes. Fold up shop. We'll make a card and we'll send it to 100 people and hope they comment on Facebook how beautiful we all look. We all know one of us got choked in the car on the way home, and I won't lie, it was probably me reaching backwards. I went for a face, caught a throat, my bad, right? We all know how that goes. We have the perfect card, the perfect food, the decorations look right, the dishes, the table set well. We are, we're doing everything we can to prepare our life, but what if we took some time and really, really, really prepared our hearts to listen to the wonderful counselor who does desire that we hear that he is speaking. God is speaking. Are you listening? Are you listening? That really is the question. Do we, do we have a sensitivity to the role of what Jesus wants to play this season? That he doesn't want to be seen as some byproduct to a kind of a cosmetic Christmas for us. But he wants to be the heart and soul of it. And he wants to give us the words that he knows they need to hear that will speak into their life and it will plunge into their life in such a way that it will pull life out of them. They will recognize not only their need for Jesus but their need for connection and community. That do we want that? Do we want to rely on the Spirit? Or do we just want to prepare think, Christmas and just kind of get through it? Nobody got a black eye, and if we did, at least no teeth were chipped. Let's move on. How do we want to get through this? Here's the thing. Being the encouragement that people need by the Spirit's power is one of the gifts you get to give this year. You just don't think of it as a gift because you know that giving it is one of the riskiest things ever. It is a risky gift. Picture whatever terrifying gift you could give to someone and then imagine giving it. It's a scary gift. You're stepping out in faith. You're stepping out in faith. But by the power of the wonderful counselor, we are speaking words that breed life in their lives. And I wonder for us if we like to be a little bit more like Remember in the series Short and Sweet, Jude, the book of Jude, you know, the godless people rely on their instincts. And at Christmas, we rely on instincts. I know my wife likes this. I know my kids like this. I know this and I know that. And we'll do everything but say nothing. What if, what if we quit being like people who rely on our instincts and we start acting and living like Christians who rely on the wonderful counselor to speak words of depth, transformation and importance into people's lives like Elizabeth did to Mary. Like, how legit would that be? If people are like, this was the greatest Christmas ever, what'd you get? I don't know. Wouldn't that be awesome? If people couldn't remember what they got, they just remembered what was said to them? What was called out of them? How would that transform the stress of your season? If you no longer cared if they liked their Best Buy gift card, 
but you were more interested in the fact, will they respond to the word of God that he put in your life? Will they respond to it? So hear these words. You have a counselor. And you might be like, I know, I see him twice a week. Nope, not that one. You have a wonderful counselor. You have a wonderful counselor who is speaking and he intends to use you to pour his word into this world, into the lives around you this Christmas. People are going to be visiting. And my question for you, my challenge for you, is be people filled with the Holy Spirit that your life could play the same role as Elizabeth's did in Mary's. That you would speak life into a situation that maybe you have no knowledge of. But one day, someone will come back to you and say, do you remember that Christmas when you said, you're like, no, oh, it changed my life. The wonderful counselor makes an appearance. Wouldn't that be great? So let me challenge you. Get your devotions on your way out of here today. Grab devotions and get into the word of God. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you so that you can't help but speak when he taps you on the shoulder with something he wants to say. Pray with me. God, thank you for speaking. Thank you for who you are and the way you're at work in our lives. Come, wonderful counselor. We, the church, find ourselves waiting in eager anticipation. In eager anticipation for you. And God, we realize that what we will have to say to people will probably be dwarfed, or our exciting news in life will be dwarfed by the wonderful words that you, the wonderful counselor, have to say through us. So God, help us seek you and not get lost in the good news of our life or the bad news in our life. But let us be, literally, let us be the wonderful counselor filled with the Holy Spirit for the purposes of Jesus in this world and in the lives around us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of what we call our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry, so make sure you check that out. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again next week.